<laughs> Via telephone, the Attorney General of the State of West Virginia, Patrick Morrissey. Patrick, good morning to you, sir. Hey, good morning. Hope you guys are doing well. Uh, we are. How, how, are you in Charleston today or are you in Jefferson County? I am in Charleston this morning, so just a lot of stuff going on uh, down here. But I am uh, looking forward to getting back home uh, fairly soon. I probably will see folks over the next uh, week or so, and I'll be up uh, around Thanksgiving time. So that's uh, always exciting, and it's going to be good to be back home. Very nice. This is an interesting uh, year coming up, Patrick, in that uh, so many folks who are elected are seeking different offices. Uh, how do you plan on navigating this next year? And do you find this to kind of be like a lame duck year going into it with so many people in these uh, higher positions moving on to different, uh, uh, possibly different well, offices? I'll tell you what, I'll start with the, the latter question. I am uh, excited that there's still an awful lot to do in our office and we're working hard every day. So, for instance, we've been pouring a lot of time in trying to help the West Virginia First Foundation uh, get off the ground. And this is really meant as the crown jewel to attack the, uh, the drug epidemic. It's a opportunity to, for the first time ever, have a plan with funding and the ability to continue to grow the resources needed and to build partnerships between the foundation, the private sector, uh, folks in state government, and uh, others in order to try to really attack some of the thorniest issues and the root causes of the drug epidemic. So uh, that takes up a lot of time. Uh, every day uh, we're working on those issues. We're working on uh, challenging matters to protect our jobs here in the mountain states, obviously enforcing uh, many of the laws uh, across the state. So I, uh, I look at it and I think, well, there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of the uh, the mix between the campaign and the uh, the day job, you know, you always have a first responsibility to do your day job. And I've always been a believer of that. And I think people who know me, I know that I subscribe to that. Uh, but, you know, things are really uh, beginning to pick up, but they'll really pick up even a lot more post-filing deadline. I think that's when we'll really find out who's running and who's not. Uh, that's going to be a key date. But uh, we're proud to stand on my record, and uh, I think people in the Eastern Panhandle certainly know many of the things that we've done, and I still have tried to get back home uh, quite frequently. I think John uh, Doyle can attest to that, and many people, because uh, it is home, and it's uh, really important to get to all of the 55 counties, and uh, I know that the Eastern Panhandle far too frequently gets left behind, and I always want to ensure that the EP and all of the regions of the state, they know what's going on, and they're certainly going to know what's going to go on in our campaign. John, you were about to say. Uh, yeah, Patrick, hi, John Doyle. Uh, I agree with you about the value uh, and, and the uh, importance of the West Virginia First Foundation. But can we persuade you to let the public know when and where you're meeting, uh, your meetings in, in time enough for the people to, for the public to attend? Yeah, so uh, I know that a lot of people talk about these issues. I am a big believer that there should be a transparent process, that people should know how the resources are going to get expended. There should be publication of those dollars, and I do believe there should be an opportunity uh, for the public to come. So I'm certainly an advocate of that. I think that what people have to appreciate is that this new foundation is coming into existence for the first time. And so uh, they are uh, putting one step in front of another, trying to, to learn and to develop. And I think that's good. And I think that what you're going to see in the upcoming weeks and months ahead is uh, they're going to uh, make sure that things are done the right way and, and things are in good order. And that certainly is very important so that people do know where the resources are going and how they get consistent updates on what's happening. And in particular, when the meetings are, it was my understanding the first meeting, uh, the public sort of found out about it by accident about a day or so no, before well, look, it that's happened. That's not true. I, I think that the foundation, people have to know that the foundation uh, really came into existence, if you will, in a more formal way last Monday. So they don't have emails. They don't have mechanisms for distribution so once they distributed we tried to get the word out and help uh but i think that 
clearly there was, I think, reporting about it. It went out a couple days uh, beforehand. And I think you're going to see once mechanisms come into place where people can have emails and send them out, I would expect that uh, people are going to uh, be attending these and learning about these. And I think that that's certainly appropriate. Uh, you know, I do want to note it is very intentional that this was set up as a private foundation. So I do believe strongly in the transparency, but it's also important that it's given some of the tools to not just operate like a lot of state entities in government. And, and that's important because you want transparency. You want to make sure that you're doing the right thing. But also we made a conscious decision to not hand that to one of the state agencies because quite frankly, there was deep concern about the state's ability to manage it. Uh, it's always had a very tricky record with respect to using some of the resources. And uh, this is something that every county blessed, Jefferson, Berkeley, Morgan, every legislator blessed, the governor blessed. And I think it's important for people to know that giving a little bit more flexibility sometimes to these groups to manage themselves is a really important thing so that you can solve problems. I'm not one of those who believe that government can solve every single problem. And it's important to have uh, limited government, and that needs to work. But it's also, when you have a choice, sometimes setting up structures which have a little bit more flexibility and can be nimble in solving problems is important. I'm not so opposed to flex. When you're creating Pat some of that for the first time, that's going to, you know, they're going to have to learn. They're going to have to get off the ground. And I'm asking everyone to be patient for that process. Patrick, I'm not opposed to flexibility, but it's public money. Uh, and and I think there is a responsibility to let the public know when the meetings are happening. And I, I'm willing to give you some slack on the first meeting. You know, that's okay. But I think going forward, there needs but to John, be enough. I, I mean, just so you know, this is not, the Attorney General's office doesn't run the West Virginia First Foundation. We obviously put everything together. And I do think people are going to see that transparency. I really believe that. And uh, that is certainly what I'm going to be urging uh, going forward. So I think people will see that. And once again, uh, I, the proof will be in the pudding. Yeah. People should uh, look and evaluate and know that uh, sometimes there are always uh, learning curves and uh, people are kicking the tires a little bit. Uh, remember, before last Monday, there was no one in charge of the foundation. They actually came together with their elections. They had a chair, a vice chair, a treasurer, a secretary. Uh, so that's part of the, the issue. As things come together, it becomes obviously a lot easier uh, to communicate, to coordinate. And Patrick, your thoughts on uh, Matt Harvey, the Jefferson County prosecuting attorney, being elected as the chairman of that committee? Well, look, I have a lot of respect uh, for the work he does, and I'm looking forward to, to working with him in that capacity. I think you have a lot of good board members, and uh, a lot of things positive uh, can be done. And obviously, I've known Matt for many, many years, and I think that he's going to bring a good uh, law enforcement perspective to bear. I think when folks look at the uh, foundation, they're going to see that there are some very talented people looking at this from a law enforcement perspective, from a treatment perspective from an education and prevention perspective and that's certainly very good so uh, look I, I'm excited with the picks and I'm hopeful that uh, they're going to be stepping up and taking really taking advantage of this incredible opportunity I have no doubt that they will uh, so it's just a lot of work in front of them we we actually went through uh, the punch list if you will a huge list of the things that they have to get done in the upcoming months and it's a really long list. A lot needs to get done and accomplished. Will there be any chance of your, the Attorney General's uh, involvement at all in the petition filed yesterday by Matt Harvey to remove the two Jefferson County commissioners who have been refusing to attend meetings? Does your office get involved in that in any capacity? You know, uh, we always look at those issues, so it's premature to say whether we will. We're obviously going to, to study all those issues and uh, certainly as a resident of Jefferson County, I, you know, I'm a believer that uh, things have to be handled uh, correctly. So we're going to take a close look at that. And, uh, of course, I, I think everyone wants uh, the situation to come back and uh, there be uh, some normalcy because there is business of the county that needs to take place. And uh, I think that's certainly important that this all gets resolved 
as quickly as possible because uh, people need to uh, make sure that the processing of normal county business is occurring. So uh, we're going to look at that and evaluate that. And, and then as the days and weeks go by, we'd be happy to let you know further uh, whether we think that's warranted. Hey, Patrick, this is John Gilstrap. Good morning. Um, in the last, hey, good morning, John. The last, I don't know, four or five years have seen an extraordinary large spigot of free money. Uh, coming at West Virginia, we we had the the um, pandemic money and then the opioid settlement money, and then Senator Manchin approved the Green New Deal or the the Inflation Reduction Act, which brought billions of dollars into West Virginia. So here we are, kind of riding this wave of I won't call it unearned, but for lack of a better term, we, we use that. Do we worry about the dark side of that five years from now when that money is spent? Are we making the structural changes? Uh, to to keep the make sure the gift keeps giving into the future. Look, I think that you asked a great question, and the answer is I think that we do have to be very cognizant of what's going to happen in the upcoming years when a lot of the federal money stops coming in. So it's a great question for someone in state government, and uh, I think that there's more that can be done certainly to help. There's been a lot of positive work that's been done, but uh, there does need to be uh, a real sense of how the next few years are going to unfold when resources slow down. But at the same time, people have to take advantage of some of the opportunities because there were resources in there for water and sewer and pipes. And obviously, there's existing resources right now for building out broadband. And I could go through the list, but there definitely needs to be, I think, a more comprehensive review of state government in terms of uh, the various functions and make sure that dollars that are getting spent are actually going to be spent wisely. And I'm an advocate of that. Uh, So I I do think you're going to see that. And we have to always be asking the question about priorities because taxpayers deserve that. Taxpayers always deserve uh, to have a government that's that's working effectively. But at the same time, in my mind, Uh, We want to have small government, limited government, uh, and I think that to get to that point, you have to constantly keep asking questions, and you have to make sure that you really know you can get into the bowels of these agencies and programs and be able to solve problems and be very uh, mindful that it is taxpayers' money. And uh, I think people know I have that record as the state attorney general. We've been very uh, frugal with how we've spent resources. And we've been very effective with that. And I do think you want to consistently challenge every agency uh, to do more with less. Well, for good or ill, if you if you win the election, that's all going to be on your desk. It feels like that's all stuff that's going to be um, unfolding over the course of the next four or five years. Well, that's that's right. And that's quite frankly, shifting a little bit on on the campaign. I think you want someone in the office who actually has worked in a lot and represented a lot of the agencies and has that knowledge and experience and who can come in and in that first hundred days start to really dig down and begin working with the legislature and make some of the changes that are going to be needed. And I'm, uh, I'm a big advocate of that. And you don't do that by just walking in off the street without knowledge of uh, what's occurring. So I'm excited about that opportunity. I think I'm ready for that challenge after serving as the state's attorney general uh, for the past three terms. Yeah, Patrick, one of this is John Doyle again. Uh, One of your opponents uh, disagrees with you on that. Uh, Chris Miller is saying that it's best to have some captain of industry that walks in off the street and takes over the reins of government. Look, I I would say this. There are a lot of uh, fine, well-intentioned people that are running, and I think people have noticed that I've tried to talk more about my strong record of experience of getting really big things done for the state of West Virginia. And obviously these other folks don't have the same record. And I, I appreciate they're going to try to do anything to accentuate uh, what they think are the positives for them. And so I'm not going to kind of take the bait and, and talk much about my opponents. I, I really believe right now we have to talk about my record and the vision of what we're going to do to help West Virginia reach her potential. But I don't think we need someone uh, – we have to 
make sure that whoever we elect is not going to take a year to find out where the bathroom's located, right? I mean, that's that's important. It's critical that we get the right people in place. And I think you need someone who's on day one able to take on the federal leviathan. A lot of the jobs right now in West Virginia do get threatened by what's going on in Washington, D.C., and we know about that. I've been involved in litigation, successful litigation, to protect our jobs. I mean, I just can't see some of these folks um, having the same ability uh, to push back against that because this is not something that you just inherit. It takes years of good experience to push back and win against the federal agencies and a lot of the crazy ideas out there. Uh, so I, uh, I think that the collection of experience, experiences that I bring to bear, I think, will be very beneficial for the states, uh, especially compared to the lack of experiences that uh, others have. Did you get a response from the NCAA in regards to your letter on behalf of Raekwon Battle and his ineligibility ruling? You know, we're, we're planning an announcement on that uh, in the upcoming days. I know that there is going to be a decision by the NCAA, and I think, uh, gentlemen, that may come very early. It could come as early as today or tomorrow. And so we're going to weigh in uh, as soon as we hear back formally from them on the Raekwon appeal. There's been back and forth uh, between our office and the NCAA, uh, but I'm going to hold until – the Raekwon uh, decision is released, and then uh, we will have more to say on that. But I, I do believe that the arguments that we put into our letter to the NCAA uh, have a lot of merit, and I take this seriously because when you're dealing with antitrust laws, uh, you have to make sure that a competition is respected. And when you have uh, athletes that are – not allowed to participate for a year, not only is that keeping them off the court, but in today's day and age, that means that they're going to lose resources, uh, NIL, name, image, likeness money. And so when you have restraint of trade and people aren't making money, that's something that uh, raises antitrust issues and has to be handled uh, correctly. And I don't know that the NCAA has uh, correctly uh, put together a policy that addresses all the challenges in this era, and those are the issues that we're exploring. I think John Doyle would like you to write another letter because Shepard got moved to the southern region of uh, Division II football playoffs. <laughs> yes, I was going to say, Patrick, while you're arguing with the NCAA, please wrap their fingers about the miserable way they treated Shepard's football team uh, in sending them uh, to the wrong place for, uh, for the uh, playoffs beginning this weekend. Yeah, well, I, look, I'm a big fan of Shepard, as you guys know, and and we should all, I'm sure you've talked about it on your program, I'm guessing, but uh, our wonderful quarterback, you know, originally from Martinsburg uh, with the Martinsburg High. I remember watching him play, but uh, the backup quarterback now getting some starting time for the Chicago Bears, and we should all hail a lot of the uh, great things he's doing as a product of Shepard. Uh, and Batchins is uh, just terrific. Uh, we're excited about that's Shepard product being in the NFL. Shepard is the defending regional champion in Super Region 1, and they sent them to Super Region 2. They're not even going to let them defend their title. They could be, wind up in Mississippi for a playoff game. Hey, Patrick, <laughs> let's stay on the sports theme real quickly, too, because you uh, also are looking at Major League Baseball's antitrust exemption, and uh, this is something that the way they did major, minor league baseball around this country has me annoyed because – uh, these folks went around shaking down cities to build stadiums for them to have minor league teams, and then the MLB pulls the rug out of so many of these teams that had gotten taxpayer dollars to build or upgrade or refurbish stadiums to keep or attract these teams. Yeah, look, I, I thought what Major League Baseball did was wrong, and uh, as many people know, they cut 40 minor league uh, ball clubs during 2020, and there was real uh, contraction. And obviously there are uh, clubs in, in West Virginia that are impacted. And uh, we know that uh, I think in, in October, uh, the Princeton Whistle Pigs, uh, that was announced that this would be their last season. And so whenever, once again, you're dealing with uh, these organizations who are restraining competition, and you're right, after taxpayer dollars are sometimes uh, put in, that raises issues. And we had looked and, and determined that Major League Baseball had been relying on a century-old 
antitrust exemption. And uh, we have asked the U.S. Supreme Court to review it. And once again, this has impact. I mean, we have minor league teams. We you know you have a team in Charleston. You've got a team in Bluefield. I mentioned Princeton, a uh, team in Morgantown. I mean, there's, there's a lot going on. And these are really popular uh, all across uh, West Virginia. And we have to make sure that the antitrust laws are upheld. So we are asking for the high court to remove the uh, baseball antitrust exemption. And there are 17 states that are on this brief. And we don't think that this uh, court-ordered system uh, should remain in effect. And uh, why should they have this uh, monopoly to do it? And I think this will be an interesting case, and we'll see what the court does. Yeah, Patrick, I agree with you on that. That stadium in Charleston was built almost entirely with state money. And the idea was to keep a minor league baseball team there, and MLB took it away. Because they were, they didn't want to have to pay more than the minimum wage they were paying in minor league baseball. Yeah, that was their reaction right. to being forced to pay better. It was to to start to strip right. clubs. That was ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, John, final question goes to you. Gill strap that is. <clears throat> Long term listeners know that sports ball is my life. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's round. That's all I know. Um, I want to switch back just real quick to politics and the how big a, a danger do you think the the growth of the so-called freedom caucus the push farther and farther to the right for republicans in the state house uh, how how big a danger does that pose to alienating moderate republicans and actually endangering the supermajority look I, I think that there are a lot of people the republican party um, has a big tent and there are a lot of different perspectives that are within it i mean you look at west virginia there's a super majority of Republicans now, and there is a diverse array of, of people and talent uh, within the caucus. Uh, if you try to uh, identify where 88 people are ideologically and say that makes up our super majority, you're going to have people that some are going to be more conservative than others. You know, I'm a conservative. I'm, I've always uh, talked about that. I, I believe in limited government. I believe in respect for the Constitution, our Bill of Rights, and our freedoms. And uh, I know that there are always going to be people that are uh, going to come together under different umbrellas. And I, I think that we should always welcome uh, people coming out into the uh, debate of ideas to talk about where they stand, what's going on. And so I, I think that those are all positive things. And we should try, though, to remember that the object is to make sure that we're standing on principle, yet we're also uh, charged, we have duties to be able to uh, get things done and accomplish things for the people uh, of our state and our country. So I think that, uh, you know, I, I, I like having the diversity of perspective and uh, I like having a conservative voices uh, advocating for the right policies. So, uh, but I, I know that there's always effort to be pejorative against different groups. And uh, I think we, we want to just allow the debate of ideas to occur uh, rather than, you know, try to attack people uh, because they join a group or they're labeled as something rather than something else. Patrick, I know you have to get going. So final thought is yours. You know, yeah, I'm looking forward to getting back to the panhandle and to seeing a lot of people around Thanksgiving and, uh, I know that there are a couple of traditions in Thanksgiving I hope to uh, kind of renew and partake in around that time. And I want to thank everyone, especially as we've had so much going on, uh, this opioid epidemic and now the related the fentanyl uh, plague that's hurt our state so badly. We've been taking it on uh, with a robust amount of strength, and it's so critical we get it right. I'm very concerned about what's going on. Uh, with at the border because it affects West Virginia, especially through the drug issues. That's how we see the border problem. It's through the drugs, the fentanyl that's flooding in. And so we're going to keep pushing on that, keep protecting our jobs and uh, enforcing the law evenly so that West Virginians know they're getting good value from their AG's office. Patrick, thanks so much for your time this morning. If we don't talk to you before then, have a happy Thanksgiving. Yes, yeah, sounds good. Thank you.